Hi everybody, my name is Jens Larsen. Few artists have managed what John Schofield has managed in terms of having a long career with a lot of different projects, a lot of different styles and different musicians, and at the same time still really a strong core of his own music. I think very often we also talk more about John Schofield, the band leader, than we actually talk about John Schofield, the jazz guitarist. And in a way that's maybe a little bit a pity because he does really have his own style, he does have a lot of things that, he, um, that are typical for him and that he does well better than anybody else. And I think you can also see that in the kind of sideman gigs that he's landed, like playing with Miles Davis and Joe Henderson and Chris Potter. In this video I'm going to take a look at some phrases that are in the solo from uh, the song You Speak My Language. It's a blues in B-flat and it's off the album I Can See Your House From Here, which is a collaboration with uh, another great jazz guitar player, namely Pat Metheny. The album actually also features uh, Bill Stewart and Steve Swallow, who later kind of became the John Schofield trio and he made a few albums with them as well. If you want to learn more about jazz guitar, improve the way that you solo, check out some interesting arpeggios or chord voicings, then subscribe to my channel. If you want to make sure not to miss anything, then click the little bell notification icon next to the subscribe button. Schofield's style, to me anyway, is really a lot about rhythm and a lot about timing. Especially with timing, he's quite loose, he can play really laid back, but he can also really log in with the groove. Another thing that I think is really important in the way that he sounds is his use of dynamics. And I think it's also really closely linked to how uh, the techniques that he's using in terms of using a lot of legato technique but he of course manages to use that in a very musical way. I think also his melodies are different than a lot of other people which is actually difficult to to really create your own melodic language but he gets really close to that uh, and I think you also see that he plays with a lot fewer notes and he's a lot more sparse in his playing uh, than if you would compare him to his contemporaries like Matheny or John McLaughlin. <laughs> This phrase is the opening of the solo and I think it's really from the very beginning clear that it's Schofield playing, uh, especially because he's using intervals and polyphonic improvisation. So I think it, most of us already associate his playing with intervals. It's something that he uses quite a lot. He's not too often playing complete chords but he will be playing intervals very often in his solos. And uh, this blues solo is definitely not an exception when, uh, when it comes to that. You can check out some of the other interval phrases in it as well. So. This phrase, the way it starts, we first just get this second, so we get it's kind of a dissonant uh, interval, and then moving to the tritone on the E flat, so really just spelling out the E flat 7 with uh, the two guide tones, and then only the top note melody is moving, and then we get this, which you can think of as being either sort of a 4 minor or just a chromatic lead note, I think it's more chromatic lead note in this case, and then down to the fourth interval here. So really what's happening here is that we have two layers. We have uh, the lower layer that's going down chromatically and then we have the blues phrase on top of that. Like this. And then he stays with that idea for the next part of the phrase. Starting with the third interval here and then moving into just a normal blues phrase. And here you can also hear that the last note is almost gone. And uh, I think that's also typical of this idea of using dynamics and really making a huge difference in between the volume of the different notes. Where this example is using more than intervals because it's really just really polyphonic and you really have two voices moving at the same time. Um, it's a little bit more sophisticated than, than just adding some intervals to your, uh, to your solo here and there. And actually another guy that does this, that, that's uh, also very much a contemporary of Schofield is Bill Fussell and he would do probably pretty much the same kind of thing but he would sound completely different. I think that's one of the nice things about the phrasing and the, um, the dynamics that Schofield is using in this because that's really what makes it sound like him more than the note choice. I could probably have done this entire video just using examples from the first chorus of the solo uh, because also the second example is actually from that chorus. It's just a little bit later where uh, we're moving towards the final cadence, so in the B flat blues that's the moving 
towards C minor F7 and uh, I'm coming in where he plays on the D half diminished G7 uh, and first we have this phrase where it's really just clearly in the chord and there's really not a lot happening here but he is using the E on the G7 but you could also maybe see that as being a leading note towards the E flat. It's a little bit hard to say if it's sort of thinking a diminished G7 or if it's really more of a leading note. And then we get this sort of characteristic bebop skip from the third down to the fifth of the chord. So that's on the E flat and the C minor. So E flat and then down to G and then back up. And then really just moving down to the B flat. Here's also normally where the line would just uh, if it was a bebop line, go to this A and then B on the, on the F7. But um, what Schofield does is that he is using sort of a more intervallic line, which is, I think, really there just to break up the flow and, and really not sound so much like bebop. Uh, because he skips up, the first note is the blue note, which is the E, and it doesn't actually fit in the chord, but. Uh, it's hard to say why it is like that. I think it's just going to the high E for the blue note sound. And then down to B, sliding down to A, and then slide, sliding from F, uh, well actually I think that's a pull off, to E flat, then down to a B, and then A, and then ending on the F here. So really, the rest of the line is just an F7 flat 5 arpeggio. And then from there he moves on uh, to just going back to the interval that he was using in the beginning also for the B flat 7, like this, so the, the A flat and the B flat. And then now because it's going in a turnaround, we move to G7, then this voice leads into a nice major third on G, so we really get that sound. And in the context that's really giving us the G7 sound. And I think also again we see sort of voice is moving in opposite direction and really thinking in how that works and this is also maybe a big part of why he's using two uh, voices and intervals a lot because you have this idea of several voices moving and can work with that. The reason that I can keep on publishing videos every week is that I have a community of people over on Patreon that are supporting my channel. If you want to help me keep making videos, then check out my Patreon page. And if you want to join us over on Patreon, I can also give you something in return for your support. The third example is starting with a similar idea as what we heard on the F7 in the previous example. So it's really just sort of moving across a large range, uh, not really a predictable melody, maybe trying to emphasize certain notes and not really thinking about uh, trying to make a vocal-like or a normal singable melody, but really just creating a different kind of sound. Starting on the E-flat, so it's on the E-flat 7, so first we just get E-flat on A, so he's really taking the A out there and of course also the root, but the A is the one that's gonna stick out, that's the sharp 11, and that's also in the melody that that gets sort of an F emphasis at this point, which is not the most common note in the melody on a uh, on a fourth degree in a, in a blues. So, so first, just the ascending part of this sort of tritone power chord, and then just moving down again, sliding down to a D flat, and then actually what he does here is really just going back into the the dominant uh, flat 5 arpeggio uh, and shortly going to the E at the end of it down to E flat so what we have here is also just what's in the song with E flat so the fourth degree moving up to the sharp 4 diminished chord the second part of this example is really Schofield reinterpreting the harmony if not really harmonizing it uh, because normally in a blues in B flat you would have in this place four and then you get sharp four 
back to the one chord and then the cadence to the two so D half diminished G seven back to C minor. And in this case, um, I think we have definitely the the four and then whether it's the sharp four or maybe even like an A seven that he's thinking on it from the line you can't really tell. And then uh, the next part instead of going to B flat, we get the D half diminished and then the G7 and then it's a little bit of a question if he also doesn't actually play the C7 anticipated and start on a few eight notes early. So the beginning of that line is also something that I think I find is really typical for, uh, for the way that Schofield plays both in his solos which probably is more um, it's less common to do like that in your solo and it's more common to do that if you're playing like a solo chord melody and uh, in this case that means that he's actually playing a line that's coming directly out of a chord voicing. So he plays these three notes after each other, which is really just coming out of a drop three voicing, D half diminished. And then the next part is kind of the same principle because as far as I can tell, I mean of course this is depending on whether he uses the fingering that I'm using right now, but that's what I would say it sounds like he's doing and also what I think is the most logical way to play it and that's this so that's the G7 with a flat 5 so that's the D half diminished and you also in this way you really introduce a lot of large intervals and again the lines are not predictable the way that the melody is using is with large intervals and it's unpredictable and, and surprising to the listener. And I think it's something that, at least to me, is a little bit uh, reminding me of Monk and his playing, uh, among other things. And I think the timing thing is also quite a lot coming out of Monk and possibly also coming out of more sort of old-fashioned blues like Muddy Waters or people who are a little bit more loose like that John Lee Hooker. So you get the D half diminished line like this, G7. Flat five, and then a C7, where I'm really thinking in the context. I really do hear that as being C7 already. And he does actually play C7 uh, on the two chord quite a few times in the solo. Um, so, and I think, and a few times he does also just play C minor. So he goes back and forth on that one. If you want to check out a video that I did on the other guitar player that's playing on this album, namely Pepithini, then check out this video where I'm analyzing some fragments from a solo on how insensitive. If you want to learn more about jazz guitar and this is the first time you see one of my videos, then subscribe to my channel. And if you want to help me keep making videos, then check out my Patreon page. That's about it for this week. Thank you for watching and until next week.